Welcome everyone once again for to the Sleep Talk or Sleep Tech Talk podcast, the pot podcast for sleep technologists. Man, my tongue is getting tied. I, I made the same mistake in the last, last episode, but let me toss it over to Robert because uh, his tongue doesn't seem to be tied right now. Go ahead, Robert. Sleep. That's right. The Sleep Tech Talk, the Sleep Podcast. We're excited to have um, sort of a regular uh, cadence of of guests. This is a continuation of our previous conversation with Marietta Bibb um, with Baycare Health out of Florida, and uh, we're excited to have her. And uh, we, we're so excited that it's a two episode series with Marietta. So um, I'm going to let uh, Emerson ask the question that we ended the the previous episode with, and um, and we'll just jump right back into the conversation. So thanks. Excellent. Thanks so much, Robert and Jerry. Yeah, we're we're thank you so much, Marietta, for joining us and and taking the time to 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 go into our second episode with us. When we when we ended the last one, my question to you was about solutions. There's a lot of them now. You know, when when we both started, when we all started, you know, in our solutions were few, and now we've got so many options for patients. And you've got this this A team, this special forces team of sleep technologists that are you know, working with your patients, what options are they able to provide? Because clearly CPAP has been the gold standard for sleep apnea, but you treat, especially with the, the doctors you have, you're, you're looking at all the sleep disorders and the waking disorders. So when your team is working with a patient, what, what's at their disposal? What can they have a conversation about and what tools and solutions can they, you know, educate the patient on? Well, you know, still CPAP is going to be the gold standard as far as, you know, trying to get the patient compliant with therapy. But if the patients are not compliant with therapy, of course, they can discuss oral appliances with the patients. Uh, we do have a physician that, uh, a dentist that we can refer them over to. And we, we are doing some uh, work with um, other technology out there to treat sleep apnea. Uh, we, we do have patients come in that have, have those devices. So, you know, the, the techs are very uh, familiar with all the things that are out there. And when I see new technology, I also tell them about it. So they're kind of, uh, you know, up on those technologies that are out there. Of course, I'm trying not to name a particular company but you know there are other things that the patient can try if they fa they fail CPAP or say I'm just not going to use it, and we do have a clinical trial as well as some technology out there. So. Well, Mary, I have a question for you that I've been uh, waiting for uh, two episodes now to ask you. Um, you. You talked a little bit about the uh, perioperative uh, screening program at your hospital and. Uh, I preach screening, screening, screening all the time um, as it relates to growth opportunities in the, the world of sleep medicine. Um, so I, I understand that you have a perioperative sleep apnea screening program. Um, my personal experience is that that has been, um, that can be a challenging patient population to get them to follow up um, with the, the sleep component of their potential issue. Um, I like the captive audience that you get with an inpatient program. So, you know, typically when I talk sleep apnea screening, it's, it's certainly about patients who are within the four walls of the hospital. Talk about some of the challenges that you've had in trying to get programs, your, your own inpatient program, screening program off the ground. And, and I know that one of the roles that, um, that you also talk about is sleep navigators and, and um, how they can triage patients and what that looks like, because I think that really is a future sort of a future state and certainly the the team that you have with the expertise and the ccsh they they're they're certainly prepared to be able to educate those patients um once they've been identified yeah well it's it's really difficult to get a inpatient screening program we do not screen inpatients and um you know we we've developed a, a algorithm for doing it um which would you know definitely involve respiratory therapy because you know, once we identify these patients, then we have to have social workers involved, we have to have our DME involved, because, you know, the one thing that has kind of hindered us getting the program completely where it's inpatient and outpatient is physicians also worry about 
uh, identifying a patient with sleep apnea and then what are you doing about it? Are you just gonna discharge that patient and not do anything? And uh, you know, that is where we, we come into an issue. So I actually, well, me and along with respiratory therapy and some of my uh, educators came up with a, a flow chart kind of thing where we actually would, when the patient gets uh, discharged from the hospital, they would have a certain, we would give them a machine, our DME company, and it would be a loaner machine and they would have a certain amount of time to go to their doctor, get an order for a sleep study, and then once they get that order, they would go through the whole uh, thing of getting a machine. But um, the patients, uh, you know, it's still a challenge there because you know, working with the DME to get that done and then have, we would have to have our, our educators actually call in the patient and remind them, hey, you, you, the, top, the clock is ticking, you need, a, uh, you need to go to your doctor. And then if that patient doesn't go to the doctor, then you got the challenge of trying to recover that machine. So it can be some issues there, but I think that it's doable. Uh, it, you just have to keep pushing toward it. And I think long after I'm gone, the people that are here behind me, they have enough education, they have enough drive in them to continue the program. And I think eventually they'll get it where it's both inpatient and outpatient. And that'll be a great win, not only for the hospital system, but also for the patients. You know, it, it, it's it, it, interesting. Here. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Robert. Well, I was just going to say, I, I know, you know, firsthand myself in, in trying to implement these types of programs, some of the challenges that you face, and, and it is the balance of, you know, they're putting the, the number of resources that you have to put in place to support the program and at the same time trying to monetize the activity to justify the, the support that you have to put in place. But that is part of what I see as the long-term change is that we have to make sleep medicine become a part of chronic care uh, chronic disease management for patients and not just this outpatient procedure that just happens to take care of patients who snore and their wife uh, complains because she can't sleep next to this guy who's, who's snoring all night. Um, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I get, so, I get so passionate about this subject because, you know, I feel like it's really, it, it could be the driver that, you know, that can make such an impact, I think, on the industry as a whole that um, it's something that can't be sort of swept under the rug anymore. We've got to figure out a way to have these programs in place, make them successful, have, their, uh, have them be monetized in a way that it supports the program. And ultimately we have a healthier, well-rested, um, lower cost of care patient population because of what we do from the sleep centers. I agree. I think eventually- I almost will. said amen at the, I almost said amen for what I just said. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I do agree. I think that, you know, eventually it'll get there. Um, I mean, with the technology that's available now and the technology that's gonna be available in the future, it's gonna cut the cost of, of uh, sleep studies and the, uh, you know, and techs are gonna move into other roles. They're gonna be successful in those roles and they're gonna be recognized in those roles. And, you know, I did have this thing where I talked about what's being done uh, for the growth of the profession. And our organizations are doing a lot of AST. You know, they're publishing a lot of uh, tools for members. They also develop a curriculum for schools. And I think that's where we really have fallen down. We need more schools out there for sleep techs. And, and instead of having more, it seems like we have less now. And um, working on some payment strategies so that sleep educators can get paid for the services they provide. I think that's very important. And the BRPT is also working collaboratively with the AAST towards some of these goals and collaborating with stakeholders like the COA, PSGs that are out there, KHAB, things like that. Uh, they're in the one thing I see that's proactive with the BRPT, they are looking at other credentials. And I think they're working on a pediatric credential, which is gonna be very important for sleep um, because the pediatric population is going to be an area where the sleep labs can continue to grow. And then of course the ASM has really uh, kind of embrace sleep techs uh, in recent years. They've uh, developed forums for techs 
and they're putting text on uh, committees and things like that. So it's, um, you can see that collaboration between the organizations, which is ultimately going to help sleep technologists and the profession as a whole. You know, uh, Marietta, that's, I really appreciate that you're talking about the scope there. So somebody that's been just getting into this industry, the, the new newer technologists that are getting into it, whether they're registered or just uh, starting their training or in school, what would you suggest to them as a course of action to take? Or how do they move forward? How do they, uh, like you said, embrace the, the, the profession? Some words of wisdom from you who've seen, who's seen quite a bit from me <laughs> in the industry. Well, I would say, first of all, don't think of being a sleep tech as a job. Think of it as a profession, number one. That's the first thing. When I first got in a sleep, I, I actually worked night shift and I worked th second shift for a long time. And I even worked three jobs at the same time because the pay was so low. And you look at what sleep techs are making now and you say, wow, I wish I was making that when I started, but you got to really uh, be driven toward improving your education, you know, not stopping, uh, making sure, you know, you attend meetings, just, um, you know, get as much as you can. And there's so many virtual meetings out there now, it's, it's almost inexcusable for people not to be re-educating themselves or trying to learn more. And, you know, get in, get involved with some of the organizations, the AAST, you know, for example, they have so much information on their website and um, they provide a lot of education. So you should get involved in these organizations, even if you're just a member, but you should get on some committees and just try to make yourself known. You know, sometimes I think it's a curse to be known because <laughs> I can't hardly meet anybody that don't know my name and I'm thinking, you know, could I just meet one person in sleep that doesn't know me? <laughs> that would be great. But, you know, it's, it's an honor to be recognized by people. And I think if you stay involved, uh, you'll get there. You know, I never thought when I started a young girl out of the Air Force that I was going to, you know, be to the point I am now. So anybody can do it. Uh, that's, that's really encouraging to hear. Uh, I still remember that first... Uh... Uh, seminar or a conference that I attended that you put together with Bernie and, and Greg. Uh, yeah. You remember out in the ship channel. Uh, mm -hmm. I still remember that. And uh, we had nothing in those days in Houston. And now mm -hmm. you, you run the Southern Sleep Society. It's, it's just amazing to see that. Um, mm -hmm. And so where do you see where do you see, uh, you talked a little bit about education, talked a little bit about outcomes. Where do you see the technologists going in, in the next uh, five to 10 years? Well, I tell my techs that, you know, you gotta be watching what's happening. You can't just sit there and think, you know, it's not gonna happen to me because it can happen to you. I mean, here the techs work for a great organization and, uh, you know, the organization supports them, but, you know, it's not gonna be that way everywhere you go. So you have to, you know, if you if you are out there working in ABC Sleep Center and you are there by yourself at night, use that time to uh, see what other people are doing. Make sure you're doing the right thing and following the right protocols. And and then also reading some reading, reading the textbooks and making sure that you are just ingrained in your education and ingrained in the profession. Don't just look at it as a job. I say that all the time. You know, it's not just a job. You're helping people, and people really appreciate it when they wake up the next day and they feel great. They tell you. You know, Marietta, Marietta I, I wish that there was a way to somehow, you know, rub the crystal ball and see where things are going to head. But if if I have one hope, it's that we we move away from not necessarily, and don't take this the wrong way, but so much focus on the test versus the outcome. You started the conversation off on the first episode with, so it, it feels like to me that we, and technology is gonna help us to sort of move away from, you know, all of this focus of being on the test versus how do we specifically get Mr. Smith, 
you know, through the testing phase and then into the best, not even necessarily onto CPAP and successful with CPAP, but the best therapy um, that Mr. Smith is going to need and that is helpful for him and that helps to produce sort of the long-term outcome for that specific patient. There is a role for the sleep tech in there. I don't know what, it's, what it is specifically and, and what it's called, but it feels like it's more of that sleep coach, educator. It's um, working as a team. Know, yeah, being a part yeah, of that absolutely. team, working as a team, you know, um, that's the way healthcare is now. It involves a lot of people to get that patient where they need to be. And we have to make sure we're ingrained in that part of that team. Uh, you know, yep. just always, if you work in the hospital system, especially, always trying to make sure they know you're there. Because, you know, sleep is such a little part of the hospital system. And if you don't do something to make sure they know that you're there, uh, you're just going to kind of get phased on out. So uh, just continue to focus on, you know, let's make sure that we're developing programs that's going to help our patients. But, yeah, when you were talking about that, I thought about, um, you know, um, I think it's going to get to the point that patients are basically kind of diagnosing themselves at home and they're using all this technology to do that. But then we're going to be the people that they come to for advice on what can I do to get, uh, you know, treatment or to, um, if I can't get the treatment that is recommended by my doctor, what, what else can I do uh, that will help me? Because everybody's not going to want to go on CPAP. Everybody's not going to want to use an oral appliance. Uh, but just even teaching them, you know, things on sleep hygiene, how can I sleep better? These are things that pe people want to know. So, you know, I think it is going to go away from the test, a focus on the test. And it's going to be more of a focus on what kind of outcome can I get for this patient that will help them. Marietta, you have given us a lot to think about today, and I want to give you a chance to uh, highlight your big program coming up uh, in, in April, I believe. You know, for some time, you have been uh, leading education with the Southern Sleep Society, and uh, can you take a minute and tell us a little bit about Southern Sleep yeah. and then um, yeah. what you've got uh, lined up? Because uh, the word is you've got quite a lineup coming. Yeah. Well, Southern Sleep Society has been around for 44 years. And actually, this year, we've lost a lot of our pioneers and founders. We just lost uh, Dr. Greg Ferris, who was the second president. And, and really, it was very heartbreaking to lose him. But... The society has thrived. This started out as just a group of doctors. And, you know, if you ever look on the website, you'll recognize some of them when they were like 30 years old and they're probably 80 or 90 now. But um, uh, they just wanted to get together and exchange ideas, uh, you know, and they would do it at a resort and they would bring their families. So they would make a, a vacation out of education. And it kind of evolved from that. And I, I haven't been doing it all those years, of course, but uh, since I took it over, I kind of, um, you know, brought in some more entertainment. We do golf tournament every year, uh, and Dr. Ferris was big on tennis, and we had a tennis tournament for many years. But this year, going back to Birmingham is especially important for the society because that's where it began in Birmingham, and uh, Dr. Uh, Burnham Pegram uh, is the one that uh, incorporated uh, Southern Sleep in the state of Alabama, and we're still incorporated in the state of Alabama. And we haven't been back to Birmingham for, since the second meeting, so it's important that we go back and look at our roots and trace our roots. And, and just being involved with all the doctors that are speaking there from UAB is really an honor to have them speaking. <laughs> so I think that people are really going to be impressed with the program. And you can go on our website, SouthernSleepSociety.org, and see the uh, agenda and the great lineup of speakers we have for that and we have a great technologist program that precedes it and we have some dynamic speakers for the technologist course can can earn up to 22 credits if you go to to the whole thing wow that's absolutely fantastic um Marietta, well, we're out of time and we want to respect yours. We thank you so much for joining. Uh, do you have anything, any last thing to, uh, to tell the audience? Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And I really uh, am, you know, just very 
I'm very hopeful and also just really uh, optimistic about the um, fleet technologists and they're going to be here. You know, I, I, in one of my presentations, I talk about Dr. William DeMint and and how he uh, just recognized that the sleep techs are always going to be an integral part of sleep medicine, regardless of where it goes. So I think sleep techs are going to be there. They're going to be in different roles, but the roles are going to be important for the overall health of, of the patient. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks to our uh, hosts and everybody. Thank you once again for joining us on the sleep tech talk the Sleep Tech Podcast. And be sure to put your comments and likes or whatever you want to call it in the in whatever platform you're listening to. And we'll see you all on the next one. Cheers. Thank you.